Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the one to five player game, World of Warcraft, Wrath of the Lich King, designed by Justin Kempenen, Alexander Ortloff, and Michael Sanfilippo, and published by Z-Man Games, who helped sponsor this video. Based on the foundations of the very popular Pandemic board game, here we're venturing into the frozen lands of the evil Lich King and his undead hordes to fulfill our quests, beat back his forces, and face him in a final battle at his Ice Crown Citadel. We'll either succeed or fail together. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, place the game board in the center of the play area. Following the instructions in the rulebook, you then assemble the Ice Crown base and citadel, putting them on the Ice Crown citadel space of the board here, with the tower inside the walls like this. In the top left of the board, you'll find the Scourge track, and you'll set this marker into its leftmost space. Then find this Ice Crown citadel quest card and place it face down into the spot for it here. Then in the top right corner of the board, you'll set this marker into the uppermost space of this despair track, nearby setting the three abominations, all of the ghouls, and three strongholds. The cards with this back are the rewards, which you'll shuffle, picking three randomly and returning the rest back to the box. Now, normally you wouldn't examine the rewards, but for your very first game, they recommend going through and finding Argent Crusaders, Borrowed Time, and One Quiet Night. You then place one reward randomly on top of the matching spaces, and these are known as the quest spaces. Speaking of which, you now collect these quest sheets, which will have these backs. Shuffle the colors separately and pick one quest at random from each pile. Or find these three quests specifically, which they recommend for your first game. Set each onto its matching colored quest space of the board, covering up the rewards. And then you can return the unused quest sheets back to the box. Then, on each quest, set a progress marker on the matching top left space, and set a matching colored quest marker into the space of the board with the same name as the quest. So this marker would go here. Now find the Scourge cards, which have this back, and shuffle them into a face-down deck by the area for them here, flipping one face up into the discard pile. These will show the name of one of the spaces on the map and provide a visual guide for where it's located. You now set three ghouls from the supply into that space. The spaces of the map are divided into three main colors, and each group of colors has a unique space showing the Lich King's symbol. You now set the Lich King into the Lich King's space that matches the color of the first card that was drawn, so we'd set him here. Now discard one more Scourge card and set three ghouls into the matching space. Then you'll draw three more Scourge cards, one at a time, and on each pictured space set two ghouls each. Then you'll draw three more cards, and again on each pictured space you'll set just one ghoul. It'll look something like this when you're done, and then you draw a final card and put an abomination figure into its shown location. Every player now picks any one of the hero sheets to put in front of themselves, and in this video, we'll set up a two-player game. Every hero also has a matching miniature, so be sure to find that, and then flip your hero sheet over, where you will be told the starting space for your hero. You now set your heroes into those related spaces. Also collect a reference card and slider, which you attach so it's pointing at the leftmost value on the hero's health track here. Then find the deck of hero cards, which have this back, and separate from it these Scourge Rises and Stronghold cards. Shuffle the deck that remains, dealing a number of cards to each player based on the number of players you have, according to this chart found in the rulebook. So in a two-player game, we deal three cards to each player and players will keep their cards face up in front of themselves. Now you take the rest of the deck and deal it into a number of piles based on the difficulty you wish to play. We'll pick the normal difficulty for this first game, which as we see here, means we deal the deck into six individual piles. It'll look like this when you're done, and if you don't have perfectly even piles, that's okay. Just ensure that the smaller ones are on the far right. Then, from the cards that were set aside earlier, put one Scourge Rises card face down on top of each of the piles. Also collect the three Stronghold cards and put one of those face down on each of the leftmost piles. 
If you're playing one of the harder difficulty levels, refer to this chart for how many strongholds to add instead. And if you're playing at mythic difficulty, the one stronghold you add is put on the second pile from the left instead of the leftmost pile. Either way, with the piles created, shuffle each one separately, which you can assume I've already done here. Then you'll stack the piles on top of one another so that the leftmost pile is higher than each pile to its right. You now set this deck by the spot for it here beside the board, returning any unused Stronghold or Scourge Rises cards back to the box, and ensuring that the game's dice are within easy reach of the players. Now the player who can prove they've ventured furthest north is chosen as the start player. Or you can just pick someone randomly. But either way, that's the setup. In World of Warcraft Wrath of the Lich King, players will be working together to beat back the growing hordes of ghouls and abominations that threaten the land. All while trying to fulfill the three quests that will lead them to the Lich King's lair, where they can attempt to defeat him, freeing the lands of Azeroth from his fearful reign. The game is played over a series of turns, starting with the first player, and then going clockwise around and around the table. And on a player's turn, they will perform four steps, starting with performing up to four actions. There are a few different action types, and you'll find these on your double-sided player reference, so let's go through these, starting with the move action. For each action spent, you can move to an adjacent space that's connected by a line. And enemy pieces do not affect your movement, but no piece can enter the Ice Crown Citadel. That said, actions are not the only way you can move. You can also use a travel card you may have. The effect on a travel card is listed as a free action, and this means it's an action you can perform on your turn, but does not use up one of your regular four actions for the turn. And there's no limit to the number of free actions you can perform. Playing this travel card will let you, or another player in your space, move up to the number of spaces shown. This will be either two or four, depending on the travel card, but if you wish to use this on another player, you must get their permission before you move them. Anytime you play a card from your hand, like this one, you discard it here. There are other cards you might have in hand with other effects, and we'll go over those throughout this video as well. But for now, let's discuss another action you can take on your turn, fighting. To explain fighting, I've set up a little situation here as an example. You can take the fight action if you're in a space with enemy pieces by rolling the two dice. For each fist symbol rolled, you deal one damage to an enemy in your space. So here, I've rolled three damage. A single damage removes a ghoul, and abominations are defeated when they take three damage in a single action. So with this three damage, I could either remove the abomination or remove the two ghouls, leaving just one damage left over for the abomination. However, as mentioned, an abomination is only defeated if it takes three damage in a single action, because damage it takes does not carry over from action to action. But there's another way that you can generate those fist symbols other than rolling the dice. If you're holding one of these fight cards, you can play these during any fight action taking place in your space, even if it's not your turn, and it will add either one or two fists to the total rolled. This can be really helpful if you're targeting an abomination and didn't roll enough. Either way, after resolving any fists or fight cards you played, you then take one damage for each ghoul and abomination remaining in your space. Let's say we had a situation like this and I rolled a fist and a shield. I would remove one ghoul, and now there are two enemies in my space, so I would take two damage. Any other heroes in your space do not take any damage during your turn. You now also check to see where the Lich King is, because he will have an evil influence over the spaces of the board that match the colored space he is currently in. So purple in this situation. We're in a purple space, so his influence applies, and any damage you would take in a fight is increased by one for these types of spaces. So here I would actually be suffering one, two, three points of damage. However, you reduce the damage you would take by one for every shield you rolled. So this means I would only take two damage. Anytime you take damage during the game, move your slider that number of spaces to the right along this track. And if your slider ever ends up on the final space, your hero has been severely wounded and must recover following three steps. First, immediately discard all of the cards in your hand. Then advance this despair marker two spaces. 
This is bad, because if the despair marker ever reaches the final space, the players all lose. Finally, place your hero on its original starting space. It is returned home to heal, so you can reset its slider to full health. You'll now be able to take a turn as normal once it's your turn again. And if you were in the middle of doing actions on your turn, when your hero reached zero health, after following those recovery steps, you would then end the action step of your turn and move immediately to the next step of your turn, even if you had actions remaining. Rolling shields isn't the only way to defend yourself against attacks. You or another player in your space can also play one of these defend cards to prevent up to two damage that a hero there would suffer. Fighting ghouls and abominations is helpful, as we'll see, but our main target is the Lich King. However, there's no way to get onto his space. Not yet. First, we're going to have to unlock his citadel, which we can do by completing the three quests on the board. To help with this example, I've moved one of the quest sheets off the board and over to here beside its quest space, which is the one with the matching colored quest marker. And if your hero is on the space with a quest marker, you can perform the quest action by rolling the two dice. Each fist you roll allows you to advance your progress marker of the related quest sheet by one. You can also advance the marker by using a single card from your hand that has an icon in its top left hand corner that matches the icon of the space you want to advance into. You don't discard the card, you just have to have it. And you can combine fists rolled with cards in your hand in any way you like. For example, to advance to this next space, I could use a fist I rolled or this card with the matching symbol. And let's say I use this. Now, you can only use a single card once per quest action. So now I'll use my remaining fist to advance two more spaces. Each other hero on the same space can also contribute one of their cards. So if this hero was here and had an axe card, we could advance to this space. Once you're finished advancing the progress token, the hero whose turn it is now suffers damage equal to the value shown here, adding one more damage to this if the Lich King is on the matching colored space of the board. However, any shields they rolled on their questing dice can block damage, along with any defend cards that get played. Also check the quest sheet in this area for any special effects that might trigger or need to be resolved. For example, on this one we're told that after each questing action taken here, we place one ghoul into the space. Keep in mind, only the hero taking their turn can suffer damage during the quest. Other heroes in the space do not take damage. Now, after you've finished a questing action, you can quest again, rolling the dice, and again using any of the cards in your hand that would be valid to assist. All in the hopes of getting the progress marker to its final space on the quest sheet. And we'll see what happens when that occurs a little later. But first, let's take a look at another action you can perform on your turn, resting. You can't rest while on a quest space, but you can on any other space, even one with enemies, and the enemies do not affect your rest action. Simply roll both the dice and heal damage equal to the number of fists you rolled. So in this case, we'd heal by two, and anytime you heal damage, move your slider to the left, that number of space is stopping if you ever get to the leftmost space. Another way to heal is to play a heal card from your hand. This is a free action and can be used on your hero or any hero in your space. You can even perform this kind of heal while standing on a quest space. Simply roll the dice for heal as normal and gain one extra point of healing beyond the number of fists you rolled. So here I'd heal three points of damage. The final action we have to go over is called Flight Path. You can use this action to travel from wherever you are on the board directly to a space with a stronghold. You don't start the game with strongholds in play, but we'll see how these get added a little bit later. So those are all of the main actions, but also be sure to check your hero cards as they may have ongoing abilities or specific actions they can take during their turn as well. And keep in mind, if an effect is referred to as an action, it will use one of that player's four actions during the turn. Once a player has finished taking up to four actions and any free actions they wish to, it's time to move on to the next step of their turn where they will draw two cards from the hero deck together at the same time, setting them face up in front of themselves. Most likely you'll draw some combination of the cards we've seen already. However, if you draw one of these stronghold cards, you must immediately resolve it. You do this by adding a stronghold from the supply to any space on the board other than a quest space, or one that already has a stronghold. And with a stronghold in play, heroes can use the flight path action we discussed earlier to move directly to it from any other space. 
Also, if you perform a rest action while on a space with a stronghold, you heal one additional damage. With strongholds understood, now we need to see what happens when a Scourge Rises card is drawn. You have to immediately stop and resolve these, and the steps are very handily written on the card itself. First, as it says here, you advance this Scourge marker one space to the right. Then you draw and discard the bottom card of the Scourge deck and move the Lich King to its colored region's Lich King space. You also add ghouls to the specific space it shows until there are three ghouls there, and you then add an abomination as well. During the game, anytime you need to add an abomination or ghoul to the board, but there are none left in the supply, advance this despair marker one space down for each piece you were unable to add. With the new pieces added to the board, you now shuffle the Scourge discard pile and place it face down on top of its deck. That resolves the Scourge Rises card, and you then return it to the box without drawing a replacement. Now, if you ever draw two Scourge Rises cards at the same time, fully resolve one and all of its steps, and then resolve the other. And if you ever draw a Scourge Rises and a Stronghold at the same time, resolve the Scourge effects first, and then the Stronghold. When drawing cards, if you ever need to take from the hero deck when it's empty, the players must advance the Despair marker one space for each card they cannot draw. And remember, if the Despair marker ever reaches the final space of this track, the players immediately lose. In this way, you'll want to work quickly to win the game before the hero deck runs out so it doesn't advance the Despair marker, and you'll also want to defeat Ghouls and Abominations so their supply never runs out because, as we saw, that also advances the Despair marker. I should also point out that over the course of the game, you can never have more than seven cards in hand at a time, and if you ever do, you must immediately discard or play cards so you only have seven left. Okay, after a player has drawn two hero cards on their turn, it's now time to spawn ghouls. And here, you'll flip over, one at a time, as many Scourge cards from the top of the deck as the value shown on the Scourge marker's space. So here, we'd have to reveal two. And for each card, you place a single ghoul on the related space. If a space already has three ghouls in it and you would need to place a fourth, an overrun occurs. Instead of placing a fourth ghoul, add an abomination to that space instead and advance the despair marker. And remember, if you ever need to place an abomination and you can't because there's none left in the supply, you advance the despair marker. Once you've revealed and discarded as many cards as required by the current Scourge level, it's time for the final step of the turn, activate abominations. One at a time, each abomination on the board will move one space towards the closest hero. If it's already in a space with a hero, it doesn't move. If there's more than one hero equally close, the current player decides which direction the abomination will go. After moving, if the abomination is in a space with a hero, it deals one damage to that hero. If there's more than one hero in that space, the current player decides which hero will take the damage. If you end up in a situation where more than one abomination is in a space with a hero, they each do their damage at the same time. So these would do two damage in total, and that means the player could play one defend card to block both points of damage at once. After activating abominations, the player's turn is over, and then the next player in clockwise order takes their turn, and around and around it goes until either the players lose because the despair marker hits the final space, or the players win. And how do we win? Well, we need to complete the quests. We saw how to advance progress tokens with the quest action, and if one ever reaches the final space, the quest is complete. You finish resolving your questing action, including any damage you might need to take or effects from the quest that must be resolved, and then you return the progress token, the quest sheet, and the quest marker back to the box. The current player then collects the reward underneath, adding it to their hand, where it will count against their seven card limit. Rewards provide special powers that can be played, usually at any time, including during another player's turn, and their effects do not cost an action. The only time you can't play a reward is while you're resolving another card. For example, after you draw a Scourge Rises card, you have to finish resolving it. You can't play a reward during it. Now, rewards are powerful, but the real prize is finishing the quests, because once you've completed all three, the Ice Crown Citadel is unlocked, and you follow these steps next. First, return the Citadel Tower to the box and flip the base over, moving the Lich King to that space where it will stay for the rest of the game. 
You also flip the Ice Crown Citadel quest sheet face up and put a progress marker onto the first space. Heroes and Abominations can now enter the Citadel, and the additional damage that the Lich King normally applies to the other regions of the board, he now only applies to attacks and quest actions performed here at the Citadel. Speaking of which, the Citadel itself now counts as a quest space, and when you quest here, you move this marker on the Citadel's quest sheet. Get the marker all the way to the final space of that quest, and the players all win. And that's the challenge. Complete the initial three quests to unlock the Citadel's quest so you can complete it and win the game before the Despair token reaches the final space of its track. The game also comes with a solo mode at the back of the rulebook, explained here on this column where a single player can attempt to take on the Lich King. But those rules I'll leave for you to discover on your own. Otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play World of Warcraft Wrath of the Lich King. If you have any questions about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at BoardGameGeek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can also join our Patreon team, which you'll find linked below. But until next time, thanks for watching.